significant to you. Okay. So uh, we should proceed. Yes. Should yeah, we proceed just, now? Just wait oh, a moment. We are just proceeding. We were just waiting for you. Okay. No, uh, yeah. I think after uh, Rehan would recite the Holy Quran first, you know, to inaugurate the session. Yes, we will start. Uh, we will start in a while. Okay. 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 And uh, okay, now I start. Press the button for recording as well. Thank you. So, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Uh, we are just going to start this event uh, with recitation from Holy Quran. I would like to request Hafiz Rehan Nadim to recite a few verses from Quran. Hafiz Rehan. Maybe there's some issues there, Dr. Maybe if you want to recite yourself, just to say. Oh, Billahi mina shaitan rajim. Bismillahi rahmani rahim. Al qariya tu mal qariya wa ma adraka mal qariya. Yom yakoon na sukal farash il mabsu. Fakulu mimma razaka kumu ma Parallel. Amma man sakulat mawazinuhu fahuwa fi ishati radiya. Wa amma man haffat mawazinuhu fa ummuhu haviya. Wa ma adraka ma hiya. Narun hamiya. Sadakallahu al-azim. So, Jazakallah. I think there was issue because the live streaming was on Facebook. So, that's why there was a delay. And uh, I'm sorry for this inconvenience. So anyhow, we have already started. And uh, uh, for welcome note, uh, we have Mia Abdul Rashid, who is convener, Provincial Standing Committee, Punjab, on social protection and public safety. And I request Mia Abdul Rashid for welcome note. Over to Mia Abdul Rashid. Uh, just a second. Shamshad, would you mind making? Um, Assalamu alaikum, sir. Kindly, uh, first of all, I would like to request to you, sir, kindly allow FPCCI video, please, first. FPCCI video. I think video is allowed. Uh, no, it's Shikar, not visible Shikar, here. Can you please look at? Okay, you can start. We'll get your video, sir. Yeah, please. Okay, now it's visible. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, uh, fixing the issue uh, right now. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank to Almighty Allah who has uh, blessed us this opportunity to host uh, such a marvelous event uh, co designed by uh, Honorable Dr. Professor Abdul Wakil and Dr. Khalid uh, from UK and from uh, Comstack, dignitaries from Comstack and across Pakistan. The way, actually, as entitled by international uh, webinar of Way Forward to Food Quality and Safety, it is uh, the dire need of the day to address this uh, issue that has become so devastating. All the people across the world have been a prey of malnutrition and like that. So many people, you can say thousands of people have done a lot to address this issue, but to a certain extent. We have to do something collectively to formulate a strategy, to formulate a mechanism to address this uh, issue that has been near to engulf us uh, to the greater extent. And I think by the dint of the expertise of uh, international speakers, experts from Comstack, 
from Pakistan Agricultural Scientists Forum and uh, from, you know, uh, up, up sign UK Pakistan, NAFs, and a lot more who are uh, striving a lot to uh, address the issue that has been applauded, that has been uh, discussed more than millions of times in this world, in this motto world, but we all are helpless to help uh, to fix this issue because of this, uh, due to this uh, horrifying issue, we are losing a lot. We are a prey of stunting growth, stunting growth because of malnutrition, and that is a major cause, major cause, uh, borne by uh, waterborne diseases and uh, uh, you know uh, contaminated food stuff and a lot more. There are so many people who are doing a lot. There are so many people who have published their uh, papers, published their research papers, have been published and uploaded a lot in this mortal world across the world. But what we need to do, we need to uh, design a mechanism. I have uttered this word thrice because of the vitality, because of emphatic expression I want to utter. Uh, I would love to request to honorable dignitaries, uh, first of all, Professor Dr. Abdul Wakil, who is chairman Pakistan Agriculture Scientist Forum, and then uh, high ups from Comstack. First, uh, it was said, it was uh, came to uh, come to my notice that honorable professor dr iqbal choudhury uh, would be there to join us having the second uh, uh, biggest volume of impact factor in pakistan i think uh, professor dr khurshid the advisor comstack would be here and, and uh, from uh, uk i have listened to his good self dr uh, khalid who has, I think, done uh, PhD in agri resource economics. So right person for the right job are here. They can uh, address the issue. And the more dignitaries who have been uh, sent to us uh, on WhatsApp like that in the groups, by the grace of Almighty Allah, I am uh, quite optimistic to see the vision, the way, uh, the mechanism who is uh, to be designed in nearest future. Uh, uh, the thing I would like to mention here, uh, the more important, not more, the most important thing is that FPCCI is uh, an apex body of all the trade associations, chambers of commerce and industry in Pakistan, doing a lot to uplift uh, small, traders in, uh, small traders and corporate class, to tell the people to, to uh, uh, align the vision of the government of Pakistan truly and accordingly. So now, I would like to offer on behalf of FPCCI, if any of your research scholar or any professor or doctor would like to seek our guideline, our platform, we are operating nationwide in 30 districts uh, in Punjab, 36 districts, and in the uh, other provinces of Pakistan, FPCCI, Federation of Pakistan Chambers of Commerce and Industry, uh, doing a lot to uplift uh, the unserved uh, community and uh, underprivileged privilege, community and a lot more. So I would like to offer the services from, from uh, this committee uh, who is headed by me as convener, uh, social protection and public safety, who is quite relevant to this uh, uh, cause. I would like to offer that we collectively would uh, align your vision we support you, we promote you, we would like to accelerate mass awareness, that is the dire need of the day, to tell the people what is malnutrition, what is healthy food stuff, what is the difference between the two. Then I would like to write to the hubs of the key stakeholders, regulators, regulators and legislators and key stakeholders. We all are key stakeholders. One who is engulfing something, one who is having the morsel of anything, food stuff, he or she is stakeholder. So we must, we all must collectively decide how to address this issue. 
we can't eradicate this one from this mortal earth uh, overnight but we can minimize it by the dint of our vision by the dint of the experts by the dint of the helpline of the research papers of the uh, global uh, you know globally applauded researchers scientists and a lot more so i welcome you all i welcome you from across the world to be here for the national cause and to tell you and to guide um, to provide only my uh, services to address this issue in a collective way so in a one sentence i would like to conclude and hand it, uh, to hand it over to um, uh, the guy the personality who would be waiting let us help us let us develop us let us help us and let us develop us by the dint of the way the vision mechanism and strategy and try let us try to formulate the pilot projects in pakistan and the universities in particular can do wonders by the dint of the quotable research papers and the quotable platforms so i think professor dr abdul wakil i would like to say uh, it's all about i wanted to welcome i am so thankful to you all vision here to bring you along with your vision here to make a difference in the society to certain extent thank you so much thanks a lot for listening to me thank you please so oh, thank you very much uh, ami abdul rashid saab and uh, we also thank uh, for your offer uh, which you have made that uh, you are willing to work together with the scientist on the issue of malnutrition Uh, i think it will be very helpful to move forward in 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 this regard so now uh, our session is keynote lectures and in keynote lectures uh, we have uh, chair professor uh, uh, professor uh, dr khurshid hasnan he is a advisor in comstec and uh, before before going to first keynote lecture uh, i would like to invite him for his Uh, word of wisdom so that uh, we can start the keynote lecture so professor dr khurshid thank you very much uh, dr abdul wakil and uh, let me say i'm here on behalf of the uh, coordinator general of comstec professor iqbal choudhry who is unable to be here due to his conflicting engagements uh, let me thank all and acknowledge all of the institutions Or at least uh, as as i've been informed who are part of this very important effort the university of agriculture faisalabad the federation of pakistan chamber of commerce and industry who have just we've heard from their side the pakistan academy of sciences forum and the uk pakistan science and Inf innovation global network or up sign and of course dr khalid mahmood who is the uh, strong spirit behind this initiative the national alliance for safe food nafs and uh, uh, i also want to mention my colleague uh, who has really been dr ms ms khazima who is not here on the screen but she has been really uh, working very hard to make this event uh, possible uh, for those uh, let me say a few words for those who are not familiar with comstec and how we can integrate uh, with you with, with the various organizations uh, as you may be aware a uh, comstec is a branch in organization of the organization of islamic cooperation the oic as you all must be familiar uh, we are uh, the standing committee for science and technology and our main function and role is to create uh, cooperation enable cooperation and facilitate uh, all such efforts to increase the scientific and technological capacities of our member countries in this regard uh, about uh, four years back in 2017 uh, the countries of oic had the first uh, summit on science technology and innovation in kazakhstan uh, this was 2017 in in astana it was then called and uh, there was in uh, an outcome document of that it's called the sti agenda 2026 like a 10 year plan i brought this to your notice because amongst the many initiatives or many priorities identified by the uh, oic countries 
and agreed upon. One key one is, uh, is the issue of food security, as well as nutritional security and nutritional balance. So uh, Comstec uh, welcomes any initiative from any side where we can be partners to further, because it is part of Comstec's uh, responsibility, uh, partly to look after this. I may brought you, further inform you that there is a part of the OIC called the IOFS the Islamic Organization for Food Security, again housed in Kazakhstan, who have the primary mandate for looking at food security. Comstec mainly is involved in the areas which are more scientific and technological in nature. Uh, for example, uh, for the past uh, two years or three years, I have been engaged in a, uh, in a program to develop the or strengthen the capacities of gene banks in member countries, which again, uh, those of you who are biologists understand the significance and we have a lot of need for having further improvements in our capacities to preserve the existing species as well as to share amongst our member countries the species, plant species, which are not uh, available in different states. So we have a major project which we are trying to find funding for and I will be very happy to discuss and share with the FPCCI uh, the possibilities of their support in some way for such a, uh, it's a five country initiative which involves Pakistan and Oman and Jordan uh, amongst the, and Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan. So it's a wide spectrum of countries who want to pull the resources together and improve their capacities for, uh, for food preserve, I mean, uh, preservation of species and, and, and how to integrate new uh, species into the food system. The other one which might be more, even more relevant to your discussion today is about the nutrition uh, aspect. And for that, we began working in 2018 and we were we are partners with the KAUST or the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia. And Professor Mark Testa is one of our, one of our leading uh, persons, ex experts who has been guiding there. So under that, we have been having some activities on basically how to use genome editing and other new breeding technologies for global food security. So uh, that's uh, one of the areas where we're trying to improve the capacity of member states. Mm -hmm. So Comstec has an, an approved project which is being funded by Comsec, a partner organization in Turkey, uh, which is again in the area of uh, new breeding technologies for food and nutritional security. So that's sort of basically, basically the kind of things uh, I wanted to bring to your notice uh, as our relevance, not only as a, uh, a your partner in creating collaborations, but also as an institution, uh, which is itself uh, trying to bring together experts and enhance the capacity of uh, our member states through, um, through partnerships within the OIC countries. But there's really no bar on our cooperation the other international bodies, for example, in the field of water resources, uh, I'm, I'm working actively with uh, the, the UN uh, to create uh, certain projects for uh, water security or water better management. So uh, we would welcome any, any ideas, any initiatives, any partnership that you wish to have with other OIC member states or with Comstec directly. So with that, I would uh, thank you very much for giving this opportunity. And I'm sure we'll have a very uh, illuminating and enlightening series of keynote lectures. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, it was a very nice word from your side. And uh, I hope uh, we will be able to, to communicate with you further uh, regarding the malnutrition. So with that, uh, I would like to start the keynote lectures. Uh, the first lecture uh, will be presented by Dr. Umar Mukhtar. He is a senior scientist in PCSIR Karachi. And he will talk about global public nutritional status, uh, Pakistan as a case study. So I would like to invite Dr. Umar Mukhtar. Gee, Dr. Omar, can you hear me?
The topic of today's discussion is global public nutritional status, Pakistan a case study. Um, I am Dr. Mohammad Mukhtar, representing PCSIR Karachi, and I am also president of Pass Forum. Sin Pass Forum is uh, uh, a society working for the welfare of uh, agriculture sector, improvement in agriculture sector, and uh, uh, is publishing an impact factor journal at the moment as well. Uh, Yeah. Global nutrition explains the nutritional status across different nations worldwide. And today we are discussing the outlook of nutritional status of Pakistani population. Uh, we all know that undernutrition is uh, usually related to low income nations and overnutrition is more common in high income countries and population around the globe. However, in global nutrition, we acknowledge multiple factors that influence the nutritional status. The sustainable development goals set up by the United Nations General Assembly are the blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. Nutrition is essential for the success of many of these SDGs. Optimal nutrition is thus essential for achieving many SDGs and similarly various SDGs impact nutrition security. For instance, goal four preaches about the quality education, but the learning and focusing Difficult, is difficult without sufficient diet. Whereas goal six talks about the peace and justice. We all know that the war and conflict are the major factors causing nutrition imbalance. So we can say that nutrition can be linked to many goals beyond goal two that talks about hunger only. WHO set the global nutrition targets 2025 in year 2014. These targets are set to achieve reduction in stunning, stunting among children under five years of age, anemia in women of reproductive age that is between 15 to 49 years of age, and low birth weight. Whereas it will be also tried that there is no increase in overweight in children. Exclusive breastfeeding during five first six months will be increased as well as, on the other hand, reduction in wasting among children under five is targeted as well. Global Nutrition Report published in 2020 explains the progress made by Pakistan towards the global nutrition targets. It shows that some progress has been made to control the stunting and wasting in under five years children group. Whereas control of overweight and ex exclusive breastfeeding are on the right track at the moment. The actions required to control the anemia in women is showing no progress or, work, or the situation is worsening at the moment. Let's have a look on current nutrition status of population groups of Pakistan, which deserve the serious interventions. In Pakistan, four out of 10 children under five years of age are stunted, while 17.7% suffer from wasting. The double burden of malnutrition is increasing with almost one in three children is underweight. Alongside a high prevalence of overweight in 9.5% of the children in this group is also visible. The prevalence of stunting in 2018 at 40.2% remains at a global critical level. The average annual reduction rate is estimated at around 0.5% uh, during the previous some time, which is too slow to significantly reduce the stunting rate in Pakistan. Since 1997, 
The prevalence of testing that means low weight for fight among young children is on rise. Despite improvements in other socioeconomic indicators, acute malnutrition remains in a state of nutrition emergency. At 17.7% of wasting among children under five years of age, where we have reached in 2018, is the highest rate of wasting in Pakistan's history. The prevalence of overweight among children under five has almost doubled over seven years, uh, and it has increased from 9.5 uh, from 5 to 9.5 in 2018. Province-wise stunting prevalence in children under five years of age is evident in this uh, slide. The highest stunting rate has been found in Fata region, Gilgit Baltistan, Balochistan, and Sin. Gilgit Baltistan data shows 9.4% wasting among children under five years of age, the lowest in country whereas the highest rate of stunting is found in Sindh province, almost double than Gilgit Baltistan figure. Province-wise underweight prevalence in children under five years of age is shown here. The underweight children ratio in Sindh is almost double than Gilgit and Azad, Jammu and Kashmir regions. Province-wise, overweight prevalence in children under five years of age show that it exceeds 10% in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, Balochistan, Fata, AJK, and Gilgit Baltistan. Around one in eight adolescent girls is underweight in Pakistan. Adolescent boys are more affected than adolescent girls with one in five is underweight. More girls are overweight compared to their male peers. The prevalence of anemia has been consistently high since 2001, when it stood at 50.9%, then rose to 61.9% in 2011, and declined to 53.7% in 2018. Micronutrient deficiencies in women of reproductive age, 15 to 49 years of the age, indicates that about 41.7% of women of this age group are anemic, with 1% having or facing the severe deficiency. The prevalence of anemia has been improved since 2011 per person than 2001 data. Now the exclusive breastfeeding trend, it means the feeding the newborn exclusively on mother feed till the six months of age. It shows remarkable improvement, which has increased from 37.7% in 2011 to 48.4% in 2018. So the improvement is visible during this period. Uh, raised blood pressure is one of the most common non-communicable disease in Pakistan. It is somehow associated with higher salt intake apart from other factors. Uh, the salt intake in Pakistan is found around 10 gram per day per person in the country. This graph shows that it is persistently, the blood pressure is persistently increasing over the time, both in men and women. This prevalence is much higher than the global disease levels. Similarly, diabetes, which is associated with sugar intake, is also showing consistent hike over the period. Against the global average for 9% diabetes in men, Pakistan has 12.5% prevalence. Now, the, the prevalence of nutrient deficiency creates alarming situation. Iron deficiency anemia, as well as deficiency of zinc, is at high level. On the other hand, about 51.5% of children have vitamin A deficiency. A form 12.1% have a severe deficiency. A high prevalence, around 62.7% of vitamin D deficiency was also observed in children. Eight out of 10 women of reproductive age are affected by vitamin D deficiency with 54% experiencing moderate vitamin D deficiency and 25.7% experiencing severe deficiency. 
uh, it is quite astonishing that the vitamin which can one get from from sun and through body metabolism it can be produced in the body we are facing the acute deficiency in our population over a quarter of these women are also deficient in vitamin a with 22.4% experiencing moderate and 4.9% severe deficiency about 18.2% of them are also iron deficient about 26.5% of women of this group are hypocalcemic iron zinc deficiency is found around 22.1% in this population group you will uh, be enlightened in upcoming presentation by professor nicola blue in later time of this program about the zinc biofortified wheat as well it is an effort to overcome zinc deficiency in one way among the deficient population groups you will surely enjoy that presentation iodine is uh, essential for thyroid function and for physical and mental development daily use of uh, adequately iodized salt is the best strategy to overcome iodine deficiency disorder across pakistan almost 4 out of 5 households consume iodized salt a greater proportion of household in urban settings consume iodized salt compared to the household in rural areas it has helped to drastically reduce the goiter prevalence in the country the mandatory iodization has effectively worked in this regard Pakistan's iodization program has been presented at international forums as well as a success story and it needs to be copied for the other fortifications as well similar interventions have been recently carried out for iron fortification of wheat flour uh, in that case the fortifican is also carrying folic acid vitamin b12 zinc similar kind of interventions took place for vitamin a and d in fats and oil sector the effective regulatory support for uh, vitamin a and vitamin d fortification could surely help to ultimately control deficiencies of these vitamins in population groups this table which is a little bit dim uh, talks about our intake of various dietary factors these dietary factors have been selected as those diets diet components that have a statistically significant relationship with at least one disease that can be generalized to all populations you know protective dietary factors are available to human being from its uh, environment these include fruit vegetables legumes nuts and seeds whole grains milk fiber polyunsaturated fats omega 3 fats and fatty acids and calcium whereas some harmful dietary factors are also prevalent around us these include red meat processed meats sugar sweetened beverages trans fat and sodium here in the table the theoretical minimum risk of exposure level that is tmrel it represents that optimal dietary intake that minimizes risk from all causes of deaths combined that means the consumption of certain dietary factor which can help to control some acute diseases uh the table shows the intake based on model estimate for adult aged 25 years and old uh the original data is also presented in this table from 48 asian countries and the sub regional data from nine sar countries it shows that apart from only few dietary factors we the pakistani population are in the situation that we are consuming the beneficial diets in low quantity than global consumption averages whereas contrarily the harmful ones are in consumption more than the global now here is the conclusion of my presentation that the vulnerable population groups are facing malnutrition across the country these require focused intervention from the government and the stakeholders more budgetary allocations are required for nutrition related programs it is a need of the hour recently a sas national program that is flagship project of the government of pakistan has been expanded in this budget 
greater coverage of vulnerable groups under the program will help to curtail the issues associated with malnutrition. Moreover, strong efforts are required for successful food fortification programs along the introduction of biofortified crop varieties. It will help to, to cut down the um, mutant related deficiencies in general public. Provision of sufficient, safe, and nutritious food should be considered as a basic right of general public. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Umar, for a very elaborative uh, presentation about the status of uh, nutrition in Pakistan. Uh, that was really uh, very informative information. <clears throat> so now we have a next keynote uh, speaker, Professor Dr. Mehran Nisa. She is chairperson and associate professor at Department of Nutritional Sciences, Government College University, Faisalabad. Uh, she will talk about the uh, impact of food safety and hygiene in human nutrition. So uh, over to Dr. Mehrunisa. Uh, Assalamu alaikum to all participants uh, and to all the stakeholders. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Abdul Wakil. It's some uh, first chance uh, to me over here that I'm joining the webinar because most of the time when uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Abdul Rashid visit my office, then I was reluctant uh, to have attend this meeting, but he forced me to attend this meeting. But today I am feeling that it's a very, very important and informative meeting or inshallah we will do something or we will find something good out of this meeting. Uh, the, today, uh, the topic of my uh, presentation is the impact of food, security, uh, food safety and the hygiene in human nutrition. Uh, when we will talk about the food safety and its hygiene, uh, then uh, uh, we are going to uh, say that uh, either all the nutrients are uh, that is uh, uh, provided to the uh, end users or the population by providing the uh, food chain system. So uh, the food safety is a very important uh, factor along with the hygiene that uh, provide the balanced uh, food along with the balanced nutrients. So here, uh, I just, uh, uh, yesterday night when I, uh, I'm going to make my slides, then I um, have gone through uh, eight, nine papers, uh, but uh, I have get some information from FEO side or some other, uh, one paper is uh, published in uh, Balochistan to some research group and one is Bangladesh. Then I came to know that uh, I have to uh, discuss over over here as uh, because the most of over here the are the tech, uh, technical peoples that is uh, that have relation with the food technology and some are these uh, soil science nutritionists that we can uh, get something out of it what is the major gap that uh, how we will combat with the, this important uh, issue that is the food safety by uh, by um, uh, providing the uh, important role of that particular disciplines or particular professions. So uh, here uh, I'm just uh, talking about the food safety. Uh, food safety first, uh, we sh uh, must know the what is the food safety and food safety, how we can define it, that it is actually the uh, save the food uh, by uh, scientific, uh, uh, opting the scientific disciplines or parameters uh, uh, for preparing and storage uh, in such a way that we can supply to the end user uh, by preventing the food uh, bone uh, illness or foodborne diseases. Because most of the uh, foodborne diseases, especially in the developing countries, is due to the 
uh, unhygienic condition of the food. So uh, here is, uh, I just uh, discuss over here the comparison that uh, in the developed countries, why they are going to save the food. They are, uh, because there is the preference of their consumers. They uh, expect more safe food. More safe food means uh, that they, uh, uh, don't have any issue about the food security. They have issue on the quality of the food. So to meet, uh, uh, they are focusing on to meet the nutritional food and that food that provide them according to their requirement or that food must be a tasty. And uh, uh, all the, when they are preparing that food, all the ethical parameter must be opted. And they just uh, consider the uh, animal health and welfare also by uh, uh, when they are uh, going to opt uh, or um, the food safety parameters. But in developing countries, because we are insecure in, uh, in food also, and not in the food, but also in the field, because my experience uh, uh, last 13 years, I uh, did work on animal nutrition sections. And in 2014, I shifted into the human section. Then I come to know that uh, uh, not only the animals, they are uh, deficient in uh, uh, nutrients uh, by providing them, them the quality feed, the uh, the uh, humans, they are more vulnerable as compared to the animals because uh, there is no expertise in nutrition sections in Pakistan uh, regarding the um, yeah, how they, uh, they will disseminate the uh, uh, information about the nutrition among the uh, peoples. So in developing countries, the excess and availability of the nutritious diet uh, throughout the year at relatively low cost. So we need food uh, that must be available or must be nutritious along with the available around the, around the year with low cost, and that must be uh, cost effective. So uh, uh, the main objective for the food safety in developed and developing countries need to be addressed. So in, in our country, like the, we are the, uh, belongs to the developing countries, when we are talking about the food safety, then we have to think about our, our own requirement. We, uh, we couldn't follow the developed countries because they are uh, safe their food uh, or they, they are wasting or lose uh, losses their food because uh, uh, only towards the quality. Yeah, measures, but in our uh, in our country, we are not only uh, want to secure our food along with the security of the our food. We want to supply round the years uh, food to the end users. So, uh, because the safe and nutritious food is a right of the every or the all peoples, or uh, that was uh, affirm, uh, reaffirmed by the 1996 World Food Summit. And uh, this is only possible then when we will going to secure our uh, food. So these are the major constraints that uh, if we are going to secure the food, there will be the loss and wasting of the food. But this thing is bear by the developed countries. But in our uh, developing countries, uh, we have to think about that. It, is it cost effective? That is only possible when we will go for the new technologies, the food technologies, they develop new technology to preserve the food and uh, that food uh, uh, must be uh, provided to the end user with more safety and uh, either because it will, it will also, uh, uh, if it is most costly, then it will not uh, reachable to the uh, common person. So this is the major constraint is mentioned over here that we have to address uh, it when we are going to think about the safety and uh, uh, hygienic food. Uh, lack of adequate food hygiene and now I am talking about the food hygiene because without food hygiene, we could not save our uh, food. We could not uh, uh, adopt the parameters of the security of the uh, safety of the food. The lack of lack of adequate food hygiene is an important indicator for food safety that can lead to the foodborne disease and death of the consumers. So, in uh, if we talk about uh, um, the what the situation is going in Pakistan, then we can say the food authority they have uh, take many. Uh, uh, steps to overcome this uh, major issue. Uh, 
uh, but uh, open air markets because we have more open air market as compared to the uh, the more safe or supermarkets that's why this disease is more pronounced uh, in our country so this is the uh, that was that is the reason uh, this is not only happening in the developing uh, country it is also going on the developed countries so the, about uh, if we uh, th uh, see globally that 2.2 million mortalities takes place due to the unhygienic food. Uh, but when we'll uh, see the situation, what is going on in, in the Pakistan, uh, Pakistan being a high burden country contributes an annually incidence rate of 413 out of 100,000 populations. So it means uh, in Pakistan, there is more issue uh, of uh, food, uh, foodborne diseases due to the uh, unhealthy or unsafe food. So here is need to address the food safety that how we will uh, going to save the food. There are several uh, ways to uh, save that uh, uh, food, but uh, the more important, the effective food system. If we will opt the effective food system, then we can uh, minimize the uh, risk of uh, foodborne diseases by saving our food. Food system supply chain is a very important, uh, we have to consider it when we are going to uh, talk about the uh, foods, uh, food safety. So here I mentioned two important things that is, uh, uh, you have read it in most of the articles that uh, from farm to the table. So from producer to the consumer, but uh, here I have, uh, already mentioned and one and other uh, important point that from farm to the feces. So, so if we want, uh, we uh, talk about the uh, food system and uh, that uh, supply chain uh, for the safety food to the end consumers, then we must think about that uh, from the producers to the consumer, is it more uh, safe or hygienic? But this is this is the work of the food technologist. They must, or the producers, it means the agriculturist or the livestock uh, keeping persons, uh, they can uh, focus on it. How uh, uh, good food they can produce. You we can you can take the example of the milk. If we uh, say that uh, uh, we are rearing our animals without uh, any good housing, without uh, offering them the good feed, that's why we are not getting the quality of milk. There is lot many when they are just uh, 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 getting the milk at home that have lot many micros present in it. So this is the major, if we want to save our food, uh, food supply system, then it is, uh, we have to focus on uh, all aspects. So this is the, uh, if, this is the major point that from farm to the table is only the possible uh, uh, to supply of the good food if the producers or the food technologists, they place their important role in it. From farm to the feces, it's a very important, maybe uh, in Pakistan last uh, in 2010, when uh, degree was uh, initiated in human section, then uh, the peoples, they are focused on it, that how much uh, good food the peoples are taking and uh, either they are taking the, because uh, uh, as I have listened from uh, Dr. Umar, that uh, the most of the peoples, they are deficient in uh, different uh, nutrients, micronutrients, especially the micronutrients. Nothing is talk about the protein or uh, the uh, fat content. This is all due to the imbalance uh, supply of the food uh, nutrient to the uh, humans. Or uh, there is need to address this uh, major issue uh, among the uh, peoples if the nutritionists, they are playing very important role in these sections. So uh, ensuring the ad adequate availability 
and the nutrition adequacy, the safety of food supply has become increasingly complex. When we will talk about all these aspects, then you know the safety and supply of the food will get complex. So uh, all of us have sit together, have uh, doing some brainstorming and get something, uh, get out of it, that what is the me role, what is the uh, other roles in to combat all these uh, issues, uh, that uh, or the constraint that uh, uh, lessen the um, uh, unhygienic food uh, condition of the unhygienic food that is supplied to the humans that uh, these conditions will be minimized by uh, if we are doing work in our own sections. Uh, so, uh, uh, I am sorry. I am, madam, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, you are talking uh, very informative information, but we have time constraint. If you can please conclude your presentation. Yes, this is, I think so, end of the... Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, here is, I'm talking about the food processing by the food processes are more comprehensive effect in the development of the country by exploring new processing and preservation uh, techniques. But in developed countries, this is a lacking. And uh, if the food technologists, uh, they are working on their sections, they can uh, overcome this uh, important sector. Uh, same is the nutritionist, uh, they can disseminate uh, uh, to, uh, to important knowledge regarding the nutritionist to the end users. So in developing countries, basic infrastructure or basic technology know-how is needed to overcome this uh, major uh, food safety issues. So uh, food meat uh, science-based safety characteristics will be uh, overcome if we will uh, talk about the cost effective, socially, ethically, and environmentally more available to the end users. So here is a, some attributes that uh, if we will opt it, then we can minimize the uh, uh, issues that is uh, hindered in the food safety. Uh, here is uh, some important role of the, uh, or the responsibility of the uh, experts that uh, can play a very important role in, uh, in food safety in Pakistan. If the producers, uh, as I mentioned in the uh, photo sessions, uh, the pictures that uh, the producer, either they are the livestock producers or the uh, belongs to the agriculture, if they can produce quality of the uh, food, they, that can minimize the uh, whatever the issues is going on in, the, uh, in that major food system chains. Uh, same is the processors. If the processors doing their job or they did work or doing research on these parameters, we can also uh, minimize uh, whatever the issues are going on in the food safety. Policies makers, they can also play a very important role in these sections and nutritionists. Uh, I have mentioned over here, the someone has uh, asked me why you uh, put it the salt plant, soil plant, animal and human health, because this is very important factor. If we all work in this, our particular sections, we can uh, also uh, save our food with the, uh, uh, with uh, implementing this important parameters. So as con consumers, they also play a very important role for toward the food safety. So role of the food technologist and the nutritionist is mentioned over here because both have a different works, both, both, the job of both have a both have a different jobs. They can, if they can work in their uh, own field, they can uh, uh, give the better input in food safety. My recommendation is to supply your safe and hygienic food in the, in the user uh, is only possible if we do work on ST and effectively in our expert fields. Uh, for, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is all about uh, that, what is the role of uh, uh, the, all the, our stakeholders in food safety and hygiene. Uh, if we will uh, doing brainstorming, we can uh, combat all these issues uh, in which we will save our food and uh, we can supply the hygienic food to the end users. So oh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Mehran Nisa. It was really a very informative uh, uh, presentation by your side. And uh, we are sorry that we had limited time <clears throat> for that.
So now we have next two speakers. Uh, they are from UK. The, the first one, Dr. Jalil Mia. Uh, he is working as a faculty at University of Manchester, a faculty of biology. And he will talk about uh, hidden hungers, the needs of the developing brain and consequences of poor nutrition, target for uh, food, targets for food fortification. And he is a very specialist for uh, food fortification. And uh, we hope that we will have a lot of good information from his side. Over to Dr. Jalil Mia. So, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me to present here. Um, it looks like a potentially good meeting. So our work has been looking at various um, conditions of the developing brain. And in particular, we've been looking at uh, this condition, which is hydrocephalus. It's fetal onset hydrocephalus. Babies born with big heads, water on the brain, it's called. In Pakistan, this affects in Lahore, where we're working, one in 200 babies. In northern Pakistan, it affects up to one in 100 babies. <clears throat> and that's just one condition that's affecting the brain. Um, currently in the West, the treatment for this is to stick a needle in the head. Uh, this drains the fluid through a valve and down to the tummy, and this stays in for the life of the baby. <clears throat> in Pakistan, it's almost impossible to have the theater time to treat all the babies in Lahore, where we're working, they get 90 to 200 babies a day with these conditions. So they, they can treat three or four in their theater time. So it's an almost impossible uh, situation for them. <clears throat> So uh, if we move along, this is the situation in Lahore Hospital. They have so many babies, they get 90 babies a day while I was there. Uh, and there are four or five babies per bed. Um, and you can see the enlarged head, the sunset eyes, which is due to pressure on the optic nerves um, and in various states of treatment. Uh, this one has had a shunt, this one has had a shunt. You can see the hair is shaved here. These two babies have got external drainage implanted for the moment. Um, so a huge problem, really. That's just one. In our research on this condition using this animal model, so here you've got uh, a normal rat and uh, a, a sibling that has hydrocephalus. You see there are two brains, so you've got the same fluid accumulation as the humans. And what we find in this brain, people assume this was brain damage but it's not, it's a, it's a developmentally arrested brain. So the brain is not developing. And what we discovered is that the cause of this is a composition change in the brain fluid that stops the cells dividing. So this is a, a concentration dose response curve for CSF from this brain on cells growing in culture. And only 10% addition of this CSF to cells growing in culture, they stop dividing, they don't die. So in this brain, we see no cell death. And, and we, what we see is that the fluid is preventing the cells from dividing and completing development of the brain. And we see this condition in, in other neurological problems. So in autism, which is a huge problem worldwide, counts for one in 60, up to one in 50 babies born. Uh, you see this fluid accumulation is outside the brain and also inside the brain, you see in large ventricles, just like hydrocephalus but it's not the same presentation. These babies do have it bigger heads, uh, but it's stabilized at a certain bigger size, <coughs> okay? And this is uh, schizophrenia. You see a lot of cases of schizophrenia and you see that the more severe the schizophrenia, the bigger the size of the fluid space within the head, okay? And this is bipolar. You might consider this a simple neurological problem, but again, uh, compared to normal brains, they have enlarged fluid space both inside and outside the brain. <clears throat> um, and we recently have been working uh, on Alzheimer's disease and you find the same thing in this condition. So early events in the, in the disease show that as the severity increases, you get enlargement of the fluid spaces within the brain. <clears throat> So when we analyzed uh, what was going on in terms of the fluid composition, this, we found that there was a folate problem. So you all know about folic acid and prevention of spina bifida and neural tube defects. 
But in this case, there was a, a different folate problem. So folic acid is here, it's an artificial substance, man-made. Uh, food folate is this one here, it's by methyl tetrahydrofolate. This is what you get from food. So you see they're coming in at two different points in the cycle. This is the rate limiting step of normal folate metabolism, which requires B12 and homocysteine. Homocysteine converted to methionine, and that conversion fuels uh, the production of uh, methylation pathway, as well as this one. I'll show you more detail later. Um, so tetrahydrofolate goes to both sides of this equation. And what you see is that folate metabolism is absolutely critical to making the two components of DNA, pyrimidines, purines here, and also in making neurotransmitters. It makes nitric oxide, so cardiovascular problems, um, uh, neurotransmitter problems, deficits in neurotransmitters and neuropsychiatric conditions, uh, and other things are down to folate metabolism. I'll show you the details of that later. So what we found in these conditions is that this protein here, FD8, is missing in the babies that are affected by these, this condition of hydrocephalus. There's one protein missing in the, in the CSF that's required for the folate to enter the cells. So they're basically deprived of folate, even though there's enough folate in the CSF, they're deprived of the folate by this missing protein. Um, and we found this in many different conditions, and more recently we found it in Alzheimer's, but I can't tell you that at the moment. Uh, so fetal onset hydrocephalus, babies born with, is missing this protein. So this is post-birth infection-induced hydrocephalus. This protein is missing in the brain. And in birth asphyxia, big problem in Pakistan, this protein is missing in the brain. Um, so birth asphyxia, 30% of those babies go on to develop hydrocephalus. 100% of those babies develop neurological problems, some of which are quite severe in terms of cerebral palsy. So uh, I think that all of these conditions are subject to a folate issue. And what we did with our rat mothers was to feed them folic acid, the standard folate, and we also gave them tetrahydrofolate and folinic acid to compensate for this protein. We gave them also a combination of these two, both sides of the missing protein. And we got a surprising result. And that result is that if you give them folic acid, you get a much more, you get more of the babies born with hydrocephalus. So we're giving high dose folic acid and we're getting more babies born with hydrocephalus. And in, in Pakistan and other countries where the minimal dose for folic acid is four milligrams, five milligrams, you see a greater incidence of these conditions and you also see more severe incidence of these conditions. So the World Health Organization recommendation for four to five milligrams in areas of endemic malaria is actually producing more incidence of these conditions and more severe uh, types of these conditions. <clears throat> um, if you give the natural folate, so this is artificial folate, if you give natural folate, you get a decrease in incidence and if you give the combination, you get a huge decrease in incidence. So going both sides of the missing protein, we fix the problem. Not only that, we can treat them at birth. So here's a normal rat baby. Here's one with mild hydrocephalus and here's one with severe hydrocephalus. Two injections of folate after birth and this one has gone to normal. This one has stabilized almost normal. Um, so we can fix this condition. We don't need the brain surgery, okay? <coughs> So this is uh, what the, more or less my last slide. It shows uh, the complications of folate metabolism. So we focus on folic acid, which is the wrong thing to focus on because it's an artificial man-made substance. It's good for spina bifida prevention, but only at low dose and only given before you get pregnant. So most women don't know that you should be taking this three months before you get pregnant which is the reason why we're going for flower fortification of folic acid, so that the whole population is getting the folic acid that they need. Uh, and, and interestingly, in the United States, where they looked at their 15-year uh, uh, effects of folate fortification of wheat flour, uh, they found two very interesting things. The first is that they got a reduction in spina bifida, which was their target, they also got a reduction in congenital heart defects. They got a reduction in cardiovascular problems 
and they got a reduction in cancer. So folate is really important to prevent these other conditions as well, but the fortification strategy gave them a dose less than 400 micrograms per day. So it's, it has a benefit at low dose, but it definitely doesn't have a benefit at high dose. <clears throat> so um, looking at how folate is doing that, if we look at the normal folate, this is food folate, it's required to go through the whole of this cycle, but it also comes down here uh, with vitamin D3 and B2 to produce uh, or, or fuel the BH2, BH4 cycle that produces nitric oxide. So that's the cardiovascular problem sorted and to produce neurotransmitters, particularly serotonin, dopamine, noradrenaline. So attention, mood disorders, uh, schizophrenia, bipolar, all these conditions uh, could be down to a simple folate fault. <clears throat> and then uh, methylation, so producing methionine in this rate limiting step, uh, comes down to uh, this SAM, which is a methyl donor, it's a universal methyl donor, and that's required for all methylation reactions. So without methylation, your DNA genes don't work properly, you can't switch them off. And also this pathway comes down to acetylcholine through through choline acetyl transferase. So it may be responsible for the initial loss of acetylcholine in, in dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, it also comes around here by homocysteine to glutathione. Glutathione is really important to remove toxins from your body. <coughs> uh, so a detoxification pathway is also dependent upon folate metabolism. <coughs> here, you've got the two halves of DNA synthesis, so you need folate for that. And uh, you can see that all of these reactions not only require folate, they require other vitamins. So you've got B6, B3, uh, B12 here, you've got B2 here, you've got D, and you've got uh, various other requirements such as iron, um, uh, magnesium in particular, calcium, uh, and other minerals are required in these reactions. I've just shown a few here. So my take home message is that um, uh, cerebrospinal fluid, the brain fluid is really critical to normal development, but more importantly, what the brain fluid is doing is supplying these key nutrients to the developing brain, but also your brains as adults, you need this nutrient supply system, which is the brain fluid inside your head. A drainage problem of any kind, so if you were to smack me on the head and I had a minor inflammation or, or, or hemorrhage, then my drainage system is obstructed. Consequence of that is that the folate system drops out and I'm now heading down the road of dementia actually or various other horrible conditions. So we need to maintain our drains open and the best way to do that is with combination folate therapy but not folic acid, okay? So our recommendations are that fortification is essential. Folic acid is fine at the proposed low levels, uh, but need but, but for higher level uh, treatment and prevention of other cerebral cortex uh, um, neurological problems, you need to use a combination of natural folates. Not only that, folates don't work on their own and you need the other components, including uh, minerals, but also vitamins. So addressing these hidden hungers is not going to be successful with a single nutrient mineral target. Uh, we have to ensure that the balance of nutrients and, and vitamins that we normally get from eating natural foods is presented to us. And the problem is that in, in, in processed foods, all of these components are lost. So I like to uh, ask questions of my students. I ask them, you know, if you've got a McDonald's burger in your hand and you've got a homemade burger, both of them made with 100% beef or lamb, whatever you like. Uh, one has been processed, one has not been processed, you made it in the home. What's the difference? We cannot deny that both of those are 100% uh, beef or lamb. So what's the difference? The difference is that the McDonald's burger keeps you hungry. You still feel hungry after eating a McDonald's burger. And this is a hidden hunger because your stomach is full, but your brain is telling you to keep eating. So this is the foundation of the obesity problem in the world, is that we're eating too many processed foods that are missing these nutrients that our brain knows that we need, 
the brain keeps us hungry in order to try and get those nutrients from eating more and more and more food. So these nutrients get lost through processing. Any processing of food, you lose this, these nutrients. So we need to think about that in thinking about how to develop uh, proper foods for particularly poor, poor population. So that's, uh, that's basically a punchline. Uh, and this work, obviously, we've been doing this for the last 30 years, and we wouldn't have done it without an awful lot of collaboration. So we have a group in Iran, we have a Libyan group, we have a Pakistani group, and particularly the Children's Hospital in Lahore have been essential uh, to our work. Um, and uh, UAF, uh, Faslabad, uh, we have a social science network now looking at factors preventing access to nutritional supports. Really important to us because we're going to develop a nutritional supplement that addresses these brain conditions, but we need to know how to deliver it to a target population that needs it uh, when currently they don't even access folic acid uh, and they don't even know what the doctors are giving them. So we need to find a way of ensuring that when we have this supplement available soon, that we can get it to the right population. So that's it. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jalil. So it was uh, very informative and uh, very, very much needed presentation. And uh, we have, uh, of course, a lot of issue uh, relevant to micronutrient malnutrition here in Pakistan. Uh, after the fortification, uh, so now we have the next lecture. So that is, will be presented by Professor Nicola. Uh, she is working uh, at University of Central Lancashire, Preston in UK. Uh, she has been involved in many projects in Pakistan relevant to zinc biofortification. And uh, they have published a lot and even a very impact oriented uh, project has been uh, delivered here and recently she is also working on a busy fed uh, project. And she will also talk about uh, that case study, the busy fed uh, effectiveness trial of zinc biofortified wheat in Pakistan. Uh, so welcome to Professor Nicola. Thank you very much. I'm just sharing my screen with you now, uh, hopefully. You can all see this. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you today. It's a real pleasure to be here and, and I've really enjoyed all of the presentations so far. So I, I would like to um, really add to what's gone ahead of, ahead of me and, uh, and talk about biofortification as a way of tackling hidden hunger. But I'd just like to start by putting it into the context of the Sustainable Development Goals. We are all well aware that SDG2 is all about zero hunger and finding sustainable solutions to tackle this global challenge. And it's a really exciting time to be in the field of agriculture and nutrition. Uh, we are right in the middle of the UN decade for nutrition. It began in 2016 and will run until 2025. And because of that, or partly because of that, there is a lot of interest in nutrition uh, at the moment, headed up by multinational uh, NGOs, such as the Scaling Up Nutrition, the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, UNICEF Harvest Plus to name but a few. And also, there are many opportunities for research funding in this area, too, through various organisations, such, such as the Gates Foundation, the UK GCRF programme, um, Grand Challenges. I know there's a Grand Challenges programme in Pakistan, also in Canada. So we have opportunity as people working in this area to really um, take advantage of the moment and do some important uh, groundbreaking research in this area. And of course, we have the United Nations Food System Summit coming up later this year, and also the uh, Nutrition for Growth Summit is being held in December. So I think now is the moment to be talking about these really important issues. But coming back to um, the topic that Jaleel introduced us to, hidden hunger, historically agriculture has focused on increasing yield, increasing calories, 
But as uh, Dr. Jaleel um, pointed out very clearly, it's, it's not just about calories. Our, our brain needs more than just calories. It is about the micronutrients, and in particular, iron, zinc, selenium, iodine, vitamin A and B are some of the key vitamins that are deficient in many low and middle income countries. And this was highlighted very clearly in the Lancet series in 20, 2008, 2013, and, and more recently in 2021. So what do we mean by hidden hunger? Well, it, it's defined as the presence of multiple micronutrient deficiencies that impact on growth, development, and the long-term health of the individual. And I think the answer to solving these, the issue of these multiple micronutrient uh, deficiencies lies in, in the food system. As Dr. Nisa was uh, explaining to us, it, it requires all participants in the food system to work together to improve the quality and cost effectiveness of our diets. And this includes uh, individuals and, and organizations involved in food production, the agriculture industry, in food processing, which is our opportunity to introduce uh, fortificants, uh, micronutrients into our food during the processing stages. Processing is, yeah, I agree, generally, a, a not a, not a um, processed food is generally not good, but, but processing can provide that opportunity to introduce additional micronutrients. Distribution um, is, is a real issue in terms of uh, maintaining the quality of food as it's transported from farm to market and also reducing waste. And consumption is where we think about nutrition and health and uh, where the focus of, of my research is. And waste occurs throughout all elements of the system. So we need to adopt a systems thinking approach in order to solve the challenge. How, what are the strategies at our disposal to enhance the quality of the food that we're consuming? Well, there are four key strategies that we can employ. We can look at supplementation, providing supplements uh, in, in uh, clearly defined groups in a very structured and controlled way. However, that's quite an expensive approach. We've already heard a little about fortification and how that has to be done carefully. And the amounts of the uh, micronutrients uh, appearing in our foods has to be very carefully monitored because too little or too much can, be, uh, can have negative consequences. We can also look at diet diversification, and by that I mean ensuring that uh, individuals and communities have access to a wide range of foods to make sure that their nutrient intake um, comes from a, a broad range of foods and is complete as possible. But the one I'd like to focus on now is biofortification, which is the technique by which nutrients can be um, introduced into our staple foods through agronomic uh, and crop breeding techniques. Uh, uh, biofortification has been incredibly successful globally. Um, there's been a lot of work and a lot of research put into this area by an organization that you probably are familiar with called Harvest Plus. They've developed strains of uh, vitamin A rich maize, iron rich beans in Uganda, and zinc rich wheat and rice in Bangladesh and Pakistan. In order for these crops to be successful and to be able to be scaled up at a national level, it depends on a number of key factors. It depends on robust evidence to demonstrate the, uh, the the improvements that can be gained through consuming these biofortified foods. And this requires efficacy studies and also effectiveness trials, with the efficacy studies being uh, conducted under control conditions and effectiveness trials being more real world orientated. It's also too important to ensure that the biofortified crop is acceptable both to the producers i.e. it provides a good yield and is resistant to pests, but also acceptable to consumers, i.e. it tastes good and performs well in the kitchen. And scale up also very much depends on engagement and advocacy with policy makers and decision makers, but also with consumers to ensure that they purchase the biofortified food and are willing to do so. Just to focus for a moment on zinc deficiency, because this is the, the, um, the focus of the biofortified work that we're doing at the moment in Pakistan, 
The global prevalent prevalence of zinc deficiency is around 17% worldwide. But in Pakistan, and this is based on serum zinc concentrations, we know that 37% of children under five are zinc deficient and 40% of women. This is quite startling statistics. And why is this? And uh, one of the reasons is, is poverty related. Uh, meat is a very good dietary source of zinc, but it is expensive. And also we know that, uh, as mentioned by our very first speaker, that dietary diversity is also low in many parts of Pakistan. Another key factor is, is the plant-based plant diet. Um, vegetarian diets, plant-based diets are very high in phytate, which binds to zinc and prevents it from being absorbed. And the consequences for children are stunted growth, as we heard earlier, impaired cognitive and motor function. In women of childbearing age, it increases the risk of complications during pregnancy, and in adults, it can improve, it can um, increase morbidity and impair immune function. So many consequences uh, impacting on a whole range of the sustainable development goals. So finding a sustainable uh, cost-effective solution is absolutely key. So talking now uh, about the study that I'm engaged with, with our collaborators around the world, but first and foremost in, in uh, Khyber Pak uh, uh, in Peshawar, uh, we are working very closely with colleagues at Khyber Medical University and Raymond Medical Institute, and also with Fauji Fertilizer Company to evaluate, it's an effectiveness trial, to evaluate the impact of uh, producing and consuming biofortified wheat. And the project is funded through the uh, Global Challenges Research Fund here in the UK, and it is comprised of th three work packages. The first one is all about the uh, whether or not consuming zinc biofortified bio wheat can have a positive impact on health outcomes. And this has been conducted uh, up in Peshawar, uh, and we have already published the protocol for this, although the work is still ongoing. The protocol is available if you would like to have a look at the detail of the randomized controlled trial. The second work package is all about how the wheat performs under different crop conditions, uh, uh, sorry, different soil conditions and fertilizer applications. So looking at the organic and mineral content of the soil, how that uh, impacts on the performance of the biofortified wheat, which uh, is called Zincol 2016. Um, whether or not ad adding additional zinc within the fertilizer can enhance the uptake of zinc into the grain and transfer that into the edible flour portion. And as part of this uh, work package, which is being led by the University of Nottingham, we are sampling uh, over 720 sites around uh, uh, Punjab province to look at soil conditions and relating that to the performance of the grain. And the third work package is all about community and, uh, and farmer acceptance of this strain of wheat to see how, it, how, how they feel about the use of the uh, biofortified crop and how it performs for the consumers. So uh, we have the, the study, the main study is still ongoing, but we did complete a foundation study uh, a year or so ago, and we have some key findings from that that I can share with you. We have demonstrated that under optimal conditions, this new biofortified wheat, the zinc 2016 that I referred to earlier, has a zinc content of around 49 ppm parts per million. This is in comparison to around 22 ppm from a standard variety crop known as Galaxy. So we're more than doubling the amount of zinc that's present in the grain through both um, the breeding process uh, that's resulted in the zinc 2016, but also through agronomic techniques, including the addition of high zinc foliar application to the crop during the growing process. What does this mean in terms of the zinc intake of an individual? Well, based on a typical consumption of around 250 grams of flour a day, which is a typical adult intake, 
we estimate that we can provide an additional 12.3 milligrams a day through the, the use of the flour produced from this biofortified wheat, uh, which is then made into japatis and rotis most commonly. And this would be in comparison to 5.5 milligrams a day from a standard variety. So we're doubling the amount of zinc that's consumed through this, uh, through this mechanism. But there is a question mark there around how well it's absorbed, i.e. its bioavailability. And that's something that we're exploring in further detail in the present study. We also demonstrated from our foundation study that in the part of Peshawar that we are, uh, our study is based, our RCT is based, zinc deficiency affects around 30% of women of reproductive, reproductive age and more than 40% of adolescent girls. So it really is a serious problem in this part of Pakistan and diet diversity within this community is also very poor. We've done some preliminary work looking at the acceptability of this grain to farmers and consumers. Uh, it is good, and I'll talk about this a little bit more at the very end of my presentation in a moment, uh, but we have published some preliminary uh, data uh, showing the acceptability uh, in, in the target community. Just with a bit more detail on the amount of zinc in the grain, the whole grain contains around 49 ppm, milligrams of zinc per kilogram. And this is split between the bran portion and the flour, the white, the white portion. If you separate out the flour completely from the bran, bearing in mind that most people will eat a little bit of a mixture of the bran within, within the flour, so it's not entirely um, uh, white flour. But if we just look at the flour portion, based, based again on a typical consumption of 250 milligrams a day, we're estimating that this will lead to an increase in consumption of zinc of around 7.7 .7 milligrams a day. And to put this in the context of the diet, uh, this table I've highlighted in red, uh, we, where we have calculated the typical zinc intake from the typical diet of this community. We're estimating that normally they would eat around 6.8 milligrams of zinc per day. And this is well below the reference nutrient intake of between 12.7 and 19 milligrams a day. So uh, we're looking at uh, intakes that, that fall very far short of the recommendations. So if we can enhance that by around seven milligrams a day, we can bring that very much closer to the recommendation and hopefully reduce the levels of deficiency in this area. But the key questions are, does this translate into improved zinc status? So we know we can improve intake, but how does that translate into status? And the way we can assess that is by looking at plasma zinc concentration, by looking at growth, because zinc deficiency results in stunted growth in infants and adolescents. And we can also look at health outcomes, including the incidence of diarrhea and upper respiratory tract infections, particularly in children. And this is what our study is designed to do. And this work is still ongoing. And we're also testing out some novel biomarkers because we know that plasma zinc concentration is not uh, a reliable indicator of zinc status, although it is the most widely used and probably the best that we've got. Uh, we are searching for more sensitive biomarkers that can detect these very small changes in intake. So we're looking at DNA fragmentation, we're looking at fatty acid uh, desaturase enzymes, FADs one and two, and we're also looking at a, a new technique for very, very sensitive analysis of a single hair sample using X-ray fluorescence. I'm sorry I'm not able to share results for that yet because the work is still ongoing and the study is still blind, but I hope uh, within the next six to 12 months we'll be able to share our findings with you. But I'd just like to end with some quotes from our community partners just to share their views and their thoughts on what they think of consuming the biofortified flour. This was a quote from one of our male participants. Uh, he said, People used to say it is for birth control. It does this and it does that. And there was some fear in our hearts as well. But now we know we don't have that fear 
And if this flower becomes available in our village, we will buy it with great confidence. And this really speaks to the concern that consumers have around new foods and the use of technology in, in, in food production. Um, but we have demonstrated in our study that through a, um, a sensitization and an education program and explaining the benefits and the safety of the biofortified wheat, it, it very quickly uh, became acceptable and uh, people were happy to, to, uh, to buy it. Another quote from a female, she said, we would try because the flower is good. It doesn't leave any bad impact on one's health. It's a matter of affordability. Everybody looks at affordability. And this is an important point. If the biofortified grain or flower is more expensive than other flowers in the market, then that will be a, a barrier for many, many individuals. And, and affordability is, is a very important part of uh, ensuring scale up of a biofortified product. The final quote here is, we will definitely try to use to buy this flower because it has benefited our body. And if it will save us money on medicine, and even if it's 20 rupees more expensive, we will buy it. So here we have an individual who's really valuing the health, potential health benefits of consuming foods with a higher nutrient content. I'd like to end there, but really to acknowledge our collaborators around the world, um, particularly those in, in our partners in Pakistan who have uh, enabled this randomized control trial to take place, but also our collaborators at King's College, uh, UK, at University of Nottingham, and the Abbasine Foundation, uh, who have been our implementation partners. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be very happy to, to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Nicola. Uh, in the next panel discussion session, we will have opportunity to ask you questions. Uh, now we have a last keynote lecture that will be presented by Mr. Muhammad Awas Khan. He is president of National Alliance for Safe Food. He will be talking on food safety and halal foods. So over to Muhammad Awas Khan. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abdul Wakil. Uh, this is an honor for me to present on this August activity. Uh, I also thankful to Comstec and uh, Pakistan Agricultural Scientist Forum to organizing this uh, important uh, international webinar. <clears throat> and especially thanks to Federation of Pakistan Chamber of Commerce and Industries for providing this platform. Uh, this is Mohammad Dawes Khan. I am uh, the chairman of National Alliance for Safe Food Pakistan and mentioned director of Global Halal Services. I'm talking about food safety and halal food and especially its context to Pakistan and across the globe too. The National Alliance for Safe Food, this is an organization striving for safe food production and consumption for betterment of human society. Uh, NFS aim to achieve uh, their goals by providing training and educating both the consumers and manufacturers, as the consumption of processed and unprocessed foods reaches an all new high. So there is a growing need uh, of training and awareness to streamline the importance of uh, halal, food safety, and quality measures. The National Alliance for Safe Food believe in strong academic industrial linkages uh, and strive to act as a bridge between all the entities. And that's why this is a very good platform today. Uh, the business community, the traders, the members of chambers of commerce and industries, scientists, industry professionals, and our foreign delegates are on our uh, same platform. And this is the aim and objective of our uh, development organization that is Food Alliance. <clears throat> In Pakistan, especially, uh, uh, we are working as a form of nation of innovators, uh, named as innovation. And we believe in the development of culture, facilities, and all that is needed to promote the culture of innovation, especially in the sector of food and uh, halal industry in Pakistan. 
the food safety uh, uh, some minutes ago we also hear from dr mehrun nisa i am not repeating the words overall the world food trade is about 300 to 400 billion dollar with the demand of industry arising there is a, a growing need uh, and there is a growing demand of uh, that product should be and shall be safe and free from any contaminations any adulterations and any hazards <clears throat> and failing to comply the food safety principles uh, there is may result in the transmission of food borne illnesses too this is a quote uh, I, I i would like to share with you that is a safer future food safety uh, is not a matter of chance it's a matter of choice the state the industry the institute the organization all they needs to choose either they want uh, to implement and own a food safety culture uh, this is not a matter of chance but we have to choose either we build our nation either we are willing to uh, to consume and uh, either we are willing to, to um, produce the safe and healthy food for our uh, uh, future generations so that is the ultimately healthy product and quality is never an accident in any farm in any organization any product this is not an accident but it is result of an intelligent effort so intelligently uh, we uh, all the stakeholders the uh, key players and key uh, food safety drivers uh, need to play their role uh, for achieving the excellence in their services, either that services is the industrial or trading services. The food borne board, uh, burden over 2 million deaths occur every year from contaminated food or drinking water. It means the food borne disease or water borne disease is uh, growing. And unfortunately, in developing countries, the budget of uh, reactive approach, I mean, healthcare uh, industries, uh, there is a lot of budget uh, investing by the government. But the, re the basic reason of that healthcare issues is the majorly food and water, food borne disease and water borne disease. So, uh, underdeveloped countries and developing countries should, it should invest more on. Uh, developing their food systems, to maintaining their food systems, to implement and own a food safety culture. Food safety is not a single person's responsibility, not a single stakeholder's responsibility, but from the farm to fork, every player and every stakeholder has equal responsibility to implement, manage, own, and operate as a food safety professional. Ensure it's safe, this is the responsibility of government. To grow it safe, keep it safe, to know what's safe and team up for food safety. I am explaining. This is the this is the slides I pick up from World Health Organization. From uh, farm to folk, from grower to consumer, this is the whole supply chain, including the transportation, including the retail, processors, manufacturers, packaging industry, and so on. Each and every step needs a measure on halal and food. I'm also clipping my uh, talk with the halal too. Grow it safe, this is the responsibility of farmers. Keep it safe, this is the responsibility of business operators, FBOs, that is food business. Ensure it's safe, this is the responsibility of our governments, our food authorities, our regulatory and legislative institutes to ensure that the product to grow and manufactured or processed by an industry is safe. Then eat it safe. This is the responsibility of a consumer. Everyone has a right to safe, healthy and nutritious food and consumer has a power. In Pakistan, consumer bodies and consumer rights councils and across the globe, consumer rights protection councils uh, established and the consumer has a right. This is, we are the driving force. Consumer may be the driving force for implementing and uh, for uh, demanding the uh, for demanding the safe food because once a consumer demand that i need a nutritious i need a wholesome healthy and a halal food this is the responsibility of industry to provide the demand of and to provide and to ensure the actual demand of the consumer so now we are clipping towards the halal halal a growing uh, market force muslim represent an estimated 23 percent of the a global population of about 1.8 billion consumers and every year this ratio increases and expected that in 2030 Muslims across the globe is 2.2 billion that is 26 percent 
Now ab about this, uh, we are seeing the effects. It means that Muslims are demanding not only halal food, but halal pharmaceuticals, halal cosmetics, halal modest fashions, halal tourism, halal healthcare products. So it means uh, halal food industry is the growing industry because the Muslim populations across the globe are there that halal food industry this is a winning approach for Muslim and non-Muslim investors. This is I directly, and this is the point which is which is the need and which is the point of ponder for our chamber of commerce and industry, for our trade bodies and trade associations that this is a lucrative approach and very good opportunity for investors. <coughs> not only Muslim investors, but also non-Muslim investors too, because there is a growing need and growing market for halal certified products across the, not only in food, but, but beyond the food too. Halal, a global symbol for quality assurance and lifestyle. This is because the global halal standard, all global halal standard includes the basic principles of food safety, the basic principles of quality management system, that is management commitment, that is human resource, uh, that is uh, continual improvement, that is process improvement, they, all the basic clauses of quality control, quality assurance, and food safety included in all uh, halal standards, Either if that halal standard is Pakistan halal standard, that is PS3733, or that is Malaysian standard, MS1500, or that is ESMA standard, that is Majlis Ulama Islam, Indonesia standard, Athai standard, all standard, including the, the fundamental lines from the Quran and Sunnah, Islamic religious experts, then technical experts, and all the quality and food safety clauses, including in halal standards. So that it means that the Halal certified product, uh, it, it ensures that it's safe, healthy, and wholesome too. This is the overall uh, scenario uh, halal food certification uh, across the, according to rough estimate, there is uh, estimated that beyond 500 certification agencies working globally. And this is the big uh, um, market for investing in halal business and halal industry. And halal is not more, um, more than a logo and more than a regulatory requirement. Nowadays, it's a thought leadership but sustainable institution and it is beyond the committed community with dedicated partnership and integrated compliance and the growth engine for the global Islamic economy. Because global Islamic economy indicators uh, some of the Islamic countries which are uh, supporting and have its own mechanism of halal industry. This is the basic uh, um, pillars of halal food management system. Uh, the OIC CIMIC platform, uh, uh, Pakistan Standards and Quality Control Authority and Malaysian Standard by uh, Jatim. The three main pillars is a source verification, that is management system and GMPs. That is actually the good manufacturing practices, including the quality practices, including the food safety practices in their system too. Food supply chain, a proactive approach to halal because uh, a com in a complex era and a complex food supply chain, there is a dire need to identify what is the source. For example, we are we are using the ketchup in our daily household use. We are we, our, our kids are consuming the burgers. They don't know the from where the bread. What are the ingredients of that bread? What are the mayonnaise they use? What are the basic ingredients of mayonnaise? What is the source of colors, flavors, and additives, preservatives that are used to process and prepare and packaged panel? It's a complex food supply chain. So traceability is very important. And halal supply chain management is the, that is a management of halal network with the objective to extend the halal food integrity from the source to the consumer purchase point. And this is a significant issue too, especially for Muslim consumers that we need to identify, that we need to rectify, and that we need to make it trustable that that product is made from halal sources. This is a, just, a, just a, a, I added the diagram that is that's reflecting the halal food supply chain management system. OIC Simic platform also developed their standards on halal food supply chain management uh, system that is a supply chain visibility also including the process quality 
Jure's product manufacturing process integrity, food safety, and halal certification. This is the automation. Yeah, this is the uh, automation. Automotive industries is growing. Certification agencies uh, developing their systems as as, as per um, uh, paperless uh, operations and are going for automations because this is the need of the industry. This is need of the uh, fastest era. This is need of the fastest halal supply chain too. In Pakistan context, Pakistan is a blessed country that Pakistan has its own halal food safety standards. Pakistan has its own standard development body, then own accreditation body that is Pakistan National Accreditation Council, testing labs that include PCSIR and then the regulatory agencies recently last year established that is Pakistan Halal Authority. And not but not least, Pakistan has competent halal food certification bodies that includes the competent technical auditors, tech subject experts and Islamic religious experts. The so Pakistan is one of the country across the globe and across the OIC member state agency that has its own complete halal regulatory infrastructure. Most of the country have no its own certification bodies, no such standard, own accreditation body. Pakistan is a blessed that we have complete halal regulatory infrastructure. Now we are clicking then halal and food safety, UN sustainable development goals. That is goal number a eight priority SDGs goals, uh, no hunger, good jobs, climate actions, then Islamic finance relevant to no poverty, quality education, uh, reduced inequality, climate action and responsible consumption, then it's halal lifestyle, that is gender equality. These all are the UNO's SDGs sustainable development goals are directly related from the, um, from the source of Quran and Sunnah that two of the most important constituents of Sharia are socioeconomic justice and the well-being of Allah's creatures. This is the order from Allah. Socioeconomic justice, the well-being of Allah's creatures, this is the backbone of halal industry. And now I am again repeating my previous slide. You must see that the sustainable development goals, basically the implementation of that social economic justice, and that is well-being of Allah's creatures. The concept of halal uh, food, um, uh, once perceived as a solely a religious matter. Some years ago, this is just known as the halal logo. It means that this is a religious obligation, a regular, not a regulatory code, but now, now in 21st century, it has become branding platform for entrepreneurs to expand their products worldwide. This is the biggest opportunity for, we need to develop the entrepreneurial scientists, we need to develop the entrepreneurial um, professionals and technical personals to establish their own uh, food safety certification bodies, halal certification bodies, inspection and testing bodies, and we need to develop the made in local products, local manufacturers and local service providers too. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is all about my today and brief discussion on halal food and food safety. Uh, thank you very much. And over to you. Uh, if you have any question, please ask me freely. Allah Hafiz. Sambi. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Awas Khan, uh, for this very important presentation. So we have a lot of questions in the chat box. And in the next session, we will try to answer a few of them. Of course, all will not be able uh, to be discussed in this session. So with this, I conclude this keynote uh, lecture session. We had uh, five very good presentation and very diversified, including the nutritional status and safety, hygiene, then hidden hunger, food fortification, biofortification of wheat, and in the, in the last, we had food safety and halal food. So that was really very impressive contribut contribution from the presenters. And I'm very much thankful to all the contributors. Uh, for next session, that is the panel discussion. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Shinawar Vaseem Ali. Uh, he is associate professor and uh, uh, chairman of uh, Department of Food Technology and Nutrition. And uh, the chair of this, this session is Dr. Khalid Mahmood uh, Upsign uh, Rothamstad. So over to Dr. Shinawar Ali. And Dr. Khalid. I'll just jump in. Thank you very much, Professor Vakib.
I think it's an amazing event. There's so many interesting talks here. I mean, uh, I would love to hear all of them, but I think the time is short. And again, uh, the way the event has progressed today, I think without any further delay, we just have to just, um, I'm just waiting if Shinawar, are you there? Dr. Shinawar? Maybe they have some issues. So maybe we can uh, uh, just sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, go to the, um, the panel discussion. I would like to invite uh, the panelists here, Dr. Muhammad Riaz from BZU University, Dr. Tahir Zahoud from University of Agriculture, Faisalabad, Dr. Munizia from Fuji Foundation, uh, Fuji Fertilizer, uh, Rawal Pindi, but he just sent me an apology. He's unable to join us today. He's been a um, catalyst in working together with Professor Nicola Lo. I uh, just want to invite another uh, uh, our panelist, Dr. Umar Farooq from uh, Muhammad Nawashif University, and Dr. Imran Pasha from University of Agriculture, Festabad. So please come along, and uh, we'll pose you some questions and uh, take it from there. So I think it's uh, as uh, many speakers have said, um, it's all about creating that um, level of um, uh, urgency in the consumer, in the in the system, uh, creating a taking a system approach, as Professor Nicola Lowe said. Uh, if we have, we could address the issue right from the farming. But the, the question that comes to my mind always is, uh, okay, what's in there for the farmers? So why they should be producing that food? Uh, is there a, 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 some kind of a mechanism that can reward the farmers? And uh, now we still, we have, because since we have got the industry here as well, uh, I would like to pose this question uh, into the panelists. Uh, in the, there are some other questions as well in the chat uh, that we we'll just have to go one by one as well. Just sort of, uh, to set the scene, um, it's, it's more important that we, we come from a, a holistic uh, view. And, and, and sometimes we are the scientists. We say a lot of stuff. It's nice publication. But how do we communicate? How do we communicate to the consumer, the end consumer, and, uh, and also the producer? So there's a disconnect between the producer and the consumer. So what the consumer need and what the producer is looking for. It. So just sort of uh, to. Uh, to spark the discussion, I'll just pose another question here. Um, uh, I mean, it's in terms of uh, where do we stand it, uh, and where the industry is uh, working with with, with the uh, with the farming industry. I would say, how many farmers uh, and how how many families they are aware of this challenge exists. So over to the panelists, please. Dr. Shinawar, if you have joined, please just uh, uh, pop in. Maybe if you want to. Uh, add anything extra here? Panelist, are we able to see you? Uh, uh, yes, and, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Halat. This is Dr. Tahir Zahur. I'm uh, uh, Director General in the National Institute of Food Science and Technology. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. I'm, I was waiting actually again for Dr. Shinabar. If he's here, then after that, I can uh, discuss whatever the questions are or with, along with my other fellows like Dr. Munir Zia, Dr. Riaz, and uh, Dr. Umar Farooq and Imran Pasha. So uh, what is the first question, please? Can you uh, let me know again? Okay, so first of all, they are saying uh, the thing that have uh, just uh, pop up in our uh, discussion forum. One, one particular question is, uh, so is there a standard that we can measure the quality of the food back on the farm? So when the farmer is producing food, and um, at the moment you are just paying him on uh, the quantity rather than the quality. So what's the best way, yes. what standards could be worked out where the farmers would be rewarded? So I, I remember I was five years ago, I was in, a, in the UK, we host a, a, there's a like a very popular annual farming conference. I think it's been happening over hundred years or so. It's called mm -hmm. the farming, uh, UK farming event. Early January, it's happened every year. And five years ago, uh, the topic of the event was, will the farmers going to be the pharmacist? Are they going to produce food that's going to okay. be happy and, uh, and the consumer is willing to pay for it? And then comes yes. a question around what happened within the supply chain and what happens uh, on the labeling side. So when I'm buying uh, that food, does it say the same thing what's written on the label? Uh, yes. Uh, so, so regarding this, uh, I can comment only for a uh, for few wording, uh, keywords like uh, food safety, as far as food safety is concerned, that it starts from the farm, definitely. If we go for the certifications uh, uh, conclusively or precisely, if we can talk about uh, to get the good food or safe food, that starts with the application of all uh, you know safety factor and certification starting from the farm. So that is the gap, good agriculture practices. And that starts from here. One example over there is that 
uh, we are using in Pakistan uh, a lot of you know fertilizers and everything. I do remember that when, when I was uh, working in the endowment fund uh, secretary of the USD fund of the USD program in the University of Agriculture, Faisalabad, we uh, we funded a project which is the uh, specific utilization of fertilizers for the farm. This is one example when we are talking about the farm only. So people, they are using uh, like one bag of uh, uh, DAP, one bag of this, flour, flour, et, et, et cetera. But this is not the way. Actually, we should start from the farm that farmers should be well educated along with uh, our uh, educators. Uh, they can use a very specific uh, dose of fertilizers or anything or insecticides, whatever is required for their farm. The basic thing is that we have developed uh, in UF uh, one, one of the you know um, uh, software uh, which which includes that what is the data of your soil and how much fertilizer you can add in. So this is the technical start from where we can do the safety. If we don't follow such kind of uh, you know measures, we can go for the higher doses level of uh, fertilizers and anything which can later on be not good for, for the health. For the food. <laughs> yeah, excuse me. And as it starts from the uh, good agriculture practices, and definitely it goes to the uh, table, uh, to the folk. So all the stakeholders which are who are involved in the uh, you know harvesting or supply uh, chain system or processing or distribution or marketing and and you know when the food comes at the table there are definitely uh, different you know certification systems who are involved commercially in those sectors we should apply and we should adopt those certification for which doctor uh, for which uh, 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 various you know speakers has also mentioned about the safety factors has a, you can do that. We can we can do a quality system. We can add into the ISO system or, or the GAP system. We, as much as we can go towards this side, maximum would be the food safety. It's not a job. Uh, sorry, sorry, Dr. Tahir, I'm just gonna challenge you here. Uh, it's, uh -huh. it's, I mean, this certification is a nice route, but okay. my so for a real literacy farmer who's sitting in a, in the samundri in in a place. Okay. And okay. they produce their own food, and uh, they are not buying uh, flour from outside. So, how will you communicate the benefits of uh, the fortification, biofortification, to them? Well, this is the job of again of our you know sector, which is the educator. So, we being a professor, we we have a lot of you know systems in our university. We have a you know a sector of uh, uh, technology transfer. Whatever searched in the universities, that should be transmitted in several ways. But it is at very lower level right now. Whatever we have, we, we all have, have to do a lot of you know work in integration with the farmers. We we conduct every year the farmers' day. We call them in the university. We give them technology, which no, which could not happen last year due to Corona uh, problem or COVID nineteen. So these are the struggles. These are the single micro steps which we should we all should take and adopt for the betterment of you know production with respect to nutrition and safety side. So in our university, we have also, uh, you know, uh, uh, fortified one of the micronutrient in uh, PBG department, Dr. Aslam, he is working on that. And uh, it, it starts from that level. Again, the problems are there. There are, there are multiple problems. If a okay. small uh, farm, uh, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm just moving to yeah. the next speaker here. Dr. Riaz, is he here from uh, Multan University from BZU, please? Sure. Your, uh, your uh, I would say, view, how do we communicate to the communities about the benefits? Uh, uh, I'm very uh, thankful, uh, uh, Dr. Khalid, uh, for giving me some time. Uh, although uh, here uh, my mentor is around. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's very hard uh, to talk in the presence of uh, uh, my mentor. Uh, sir, uh, the core issue which uh, Dr. Tahir Zahur has discussed is basically the uh, implementation of uh, global gap at the farm. Uh, in Pakistan, the government uh, basically is not focusing on this issue. Uh, if we see the savage water is being uh, irrigated, uh, being used for the irrigation purposes. And uh, what is the level of uh, literacy of the farmer? They 
uh, when uproot they when they uproot uh, vegetables they wash those vegetables uh, in uh, in muddy area in in the same uh, uh, sewage water uh, i have observed by my own uh, that the farmers uh, they uh, they don't care about the cleaning of the vegetables and how do how those vegetables are packed and then then they are stuffed in the market and then we purchase it so at the same time there is a need of the literacy there is a need of the training as well as there is a need of the government uh, the regulating agencies that they should focus on the core issue of uh, uh environmental uh, as well as the environment, environmental agencies uh, they had they should play their role in order to uh, tackle this issue of uh, the use of the wastage water that water uh, which is drained out from the hospitals from the cities that is uh, 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 poured into the rivers uh, canals and river and then those distributaries again uh, supply this water to the uh, to the farms so how these issues can be tackled uh, until less the government uh, should not take care of uh, such a big issue so okay. thank, you, that, that, thank you dr riaz i'm going to challenge you again another thing uh, i think it's it's a, it's the best uh, um, the government should take the responsibilities where come the consumers so what is the role of the consumers where you see they are they aware enough they are looking at those stress elements do they know the value of uh, zinc and iron and and iodine i'm by the way great fan of selenium because it's really good for your brain functioning so is this something uh, uh, part of a curriculum is it something we teach in schools i mean i just want to hear a little bit more uh, sort of in terms of where could be these strategic things could happen so the system approach again please Uh, Tom, you are you are asking now. Should I answer or somebody else yes, is here? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. If you want to answer, otherwise I'm okay. going to. Okay. 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 Uh, time is short because we have a lot of things to discuss here. It's very important. I appreciate the organizers to conduct such kind of you know uh, webinars. So uh, as far as food safety and nutrition, they are all together. You know, if we talk about the nutrition, it is very very far away right now from over technology to bio fortify this. Although there are few examples who are doing, but on the other side, when you are talking about the food safety, food safety matters uh, uh, will be involved at the farm level in two way. First of all, one from the microbial side and one from the toxic level of the fertilizer or any additional you know uh, 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 chemicals. So when we talk about the consumer's point of view, we have a lot of you know uh, opportunities like we can we can communicate them through trainings. We can do uh, communication through TV talks, uh, TV uh, channels, and radio talks. We have already these kind of all certain things like this. But the dilemma is that our literacy rate is very less. You know, during Corona, again, the people were having a lot of, you know, uh, uh, conspiracies that there's Corona, there's no Corona, there's kind of this, this and this. So this is the duty I feel. If we uh, feel over duty sincerely, that we all professors who are dealing with the direct consumer's product, we should come to the communication system. Uh, although it is included in the curriculum, we have cur curriculum uh, with uh, our National Institute of Food Science, which is which is the leading institute, and that we we are the one who uh, started this human nutrition and dietetics. You you very well said that selenium and other micronutrients they are important for everything. So we have a curriculum, we have all these things over there, and we can improve further if there is need. But there is Thank a need. Yeah. There is a need. Dr. Thay. I'm just going to move on to our colleague from uh, Muhammad Nawashif University. Yeah. Uh, there, please. Dr. Uh, Dr. Umar Farooq Saab, please, uh, your comments. How do we overcome this challenge of uh, mobilization or lack of uh, information or the gap or importance of, I mean, people would prefer to buy a maybe a medicine rather than supplement. So where, where, where does it, this whole story uh, go, please? Are you there? Excuse uh, me. Excuse me, sir. Dr. Omar Farooq not here. Oh, Dr. Omar is not there. Okay. So then I move on to the Dr. Uh, Imran Pasha from University of Faisalabad. Are you there, please? No, sir. Dr. Are you, Imran uh, Pasha also. He, yeah, Dr. Imran Pasha was here, but I think he has gone for a, uh, one of the uh, meeting. I should also announce here that this, this meeting is for the Quaker. You know, we got a big project of uh, 
uh, you know, establishment of Power Korea Nutrition Center to improve child and community nutrition, which is a big amount, uh, 1,593 million. And we got this and uh, uh, while getting the benefit of this meeting, I can announce this, uh, whosoever uh, want to get any kind of information, they should come to us. We can also communicate with our, uh, you know, uh, our networking of Dr. Riaz and all other uh, members. So he's not here. He has gone to the meeting, I think. So Dr. Imran Pasha. Okay. Dr. Thad, thank you very much. I'm just going to ask some questions here. People have asked in the, in the chat. Sure. Part. So oh, sure. here's a question. So Pakistan, in Pakistan, poor processing and storage of milk, cereal grains and nuts are major cause of aflatoxins, contamination and mold proliferation. So how, yeah. proliferation, sorry. So how can we look at this issue? Uh, it's again around processing, but also uh, post, post farm gate, so uh, food storage. Okay. Yes. So uh, I will let Dr. Uh, Riaz, if we want to ask, uh, answer this question, then I will be with him. Okay. Okay, sir. <laughs> Uh, so thanks so much. Uh, uh, I have did a lot of work on uh, aflatoxins, many of the papers uh, and uh, many of uh, the projects we have run. Uh, and uh, after that, we have uh, concluded, uh, and this is my conclusion that unless uh, we uh, do not tackle at the farm, uh, we are unable to control uh, aflatoxins uh, in the food during processing because uh, many of uh, the aflatoxins, uh, mycotoxins, they are heat stable. So they become the part, once they become the part of the food, it's uh, impossible to control them. Th this is the only solution that those should be controlled at the farm to the feed by uh, best management practices. The feed should be supplied to the, uh, to the animals, milking animals, uh, and the, and the, and the, for aflatoxin B1, etc., the processing conditions uh, uh, before the processing conditions, uh, those uh, commodities uh, should be uh, 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 should be stored after processing. Uh, uh, there, uh, the, the time duration between the harvesting and the processing should be reduced, and the moisture should be controlled as early as possible. And this is the only way that we reduce uh, the time duration as well as process them uh, as speedily as possible. So this is one of uh, the biggest uh, management practice and we should try to uh, manage the things in the, at the farm level and before processing. And if there is a need to process like chilies, et cetera, these should be processed as early as possible. So to assist your answer, please. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Khalid, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, yeah, I think. Yeah. We, so, we, just for just just for a comprehensive uh, uh, review and my conclusions regarding all these matters, I always go for the slogan of cottage industries, cottage industry as well as on the on farm processing. So, whatever whatever is being produced. Once we get inside the soil and once we get into the produce or once we get into the animal or once we get into the milk, so that must be processed as soon as possible and or as it should be supplied as soon as possible to the end consumer. This will definitely reduce the wastage of the product and this was the success of China and we should follow these all things. For all questions, why once this answer is, I think we need, we need to have more and more training. We need to have more and more communications to our all stakeholders and even over, over network. Let's say I have a 10,000 student in Pakistan. They must be following uh, with each other regarding this slogan of a cottage industry, improving entrepreneurship and reducing the wastage of the product and also improving the food safety factor. Thank you so much, Dr. Pratt. Very wonderful. I just want to ask some other um, our keynote speakers who were earlier here. Just want to ask here, uh, Dr. Jaleel, uh, what's in your view? I mean, you mentioned folic acid is the key, and uh, in your view, what, what is the key challenge at the moment? Uh, this knowledge is not. I'm, I'm going back to the knowledge again and again. So, but <laughs> maybe, uh, how do how we can get that barrier, Jaleel? Sorry, I didn't quite and hear country, the question. The example is good. Yeah, any developing countries where they have made it. Somebody was said that, uh, telling me a story. They are trying to promote uh, some kind of local indigenous solution. But over to you, please. Thank you. 
sorry, I didn't hear the beginning of your question. Could you so my question was, uh, um, I mean, uh, interesting stories about folic acid. I mean, yeah. uh, these elements and uh, their benefit to the to the humans. I mean, uh, where the where is the biggest uh, stumbling block in terms of? Uh, it's not been communicated. These clinicians uh, do not look into it. Uh, is, is it issue of uh, affordability? How expensive is folic acid? For yeah, so um, uh, my colleague, uh, Shazia Yasmin, she's done a social science project with us, asking women who are presenting with their babies at the children's hospital, what, what were the barriers to getting folic acid? First thing is, they don't know what the doctors are giving them. So we only identified that they were getting folic acid from the color of the tablets, they told us. <laughs> uh, I think knowledge is the first step. The second is availability. And uh, third is um, uh, in practice, you need to show whether this fortified wheat flour is actually available in Pakistan. We'll talk about it being available. I know the UK sent 39 million pounds to Pakistan to fortify wheat flour. Uh, but it's not available. Where is this wheat flour that you talk about? You know, it's it's not. I've, I haven't seen it in anywhere in in Pakistan when I'm over there. Um, so uh, we talk about fortified foods, but they're not available. And the target audience, the poor people, they don't have access to any of that anyway. They grow their own and and mill their own and they eat their own. So there's no fortification possible for them. So I think it's a combination of of knowledge access. Uh, but also uh, of the of the kind of the controllers within families. So we had a lot of information from these women that they don't make any decision. A lot of them were saying they don't make decisions. Their husbands make decisions, and the other key decision maker is the mother-in-law, and they don't allow them to take these things. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Very good. So no, thank you. Uh, uh, so any, um, Excuse me, yes. Dr. Khalid. Are you back yeah, there? Yeah, this is Dr. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I was there and there was some issue in the connection. So I was listening to you, but I could not uh, make my voice uh, in, the, in the conference. So uh, I have uh, one important question from the audience. And uh, the question is from uh, Dr. Nikola. Uh, that if various biofortified crops are developed, then how will we be able to ensure the balanced diet? Dr. Nikola, this is from you. Uh, that's um, question from one of the audience that if we develop different biofortified crops based on nutrients, then how we can assure the balanced diet? So, biofortified crops will be part and parcel of a, a balanced diet. I don't think we're going to solve micronutrient deficiencies solely by enhancing the micronutrient content of staples. A, bi a balanced diet is still incredibly important uh, to ensure um, di diversity and the broad range of nutrients and, and phytochemicals that are important for health. So I think, you know, I think it's a combination of both. Um, uh, biofortification is not the silver bullet. It needs to be in the context of a healthy, balanced diet. And I know that is a challenge in, in some uh, communities, particularly low resource communities, where affordability of a balanced diet is, is a real challenge. Um, but uh, certainly biofortification can go some way towards alleviating some of the, the, the major deficiencies. But um, yeah, education and welfare support and ensuring that crops are, are, are widely available and affordable uh, for all communities is really important. Yeah, thank you very much, Nicola. Uh... There's one, one more question from the audience. Dr. Shinawar, excuse me. Yeah, Dr. Shinawar, excuse me. With reference to talk of uh, answer of uh, Dr. Jalil Mia, I agree with the uh, answer that there's no availability of 40, fortified wheat flour over here. There is a need to make regulation. So there, there's a gap for regulation. There, there's a government job here. So we need to have this regulation and there will be definitely fortified wheat flour. And as and rather than doing only in the in, uh, big factories or commercially available, we are we have also tried once over there in the United Nations when I was in working with the wheat fortification in Chucky, small you know mill, millers. So there is again chance to optimize those, and there's need to. I, I must add this one to Dr. Khalid, please add on the uh, proceeding or, or the conclusion. There, there should be regulation by the government of Pakistan. Thank you. 
There was one more question uh, that can. Uh, uh, this is again from Dr. Nicola. Someone is asking you. You have good work of the biofortification in meat. So, uh, Dr. Marinosa is asking, can we also work on the uh, egg and milk uh, with reference to this fortification? Um, I'm sure that's technically possible. Um, certainly, vitamin D uh, fortification of milk is, is common in many countries around the world. Uh, and also, uh, the, the fortification of, of, of salt with iodine is common. I mean, there, there are lots of examples of where we can fortify or biofortify a, a wide range of food products. I, I'd just like to, to go back to um, the questions and discussion around the availability of biofortified wheat in Pakistan. I, I, I hear what my colleagues are, are saying, and I think I am aware that the Harvest Plus have been working with the government to roll out um, a biofortified, zinc biofortified wheat in, in lots of parts of Pakistan. So I, I wonder whether there's an awareness issue um, or whether it is still very early days yet and it hasn't reached uh, the, the broader market. But I, I guess that's a question uh, for, for our other panel members. Thank you, Dr. Nicola. Uh, I think if Dr. Madhusa is in the uh, is here, she can explain her question. But what what I got from her question, I, I think she's asking: there is the concept of biofortification of crops. Can we extend this concept of uh, biofortification to animals like animal products? Is there any possibility, or some some work is going on, or some experience about this? I think she wants to ask like this. Um, I think that the. <laughs> Biofortification is, is the enhancement of the micronutrient in, uh, content through um, crop, crop, I mean, it's mainly focused on crops, crop breeding and, and agronomic techniques. Whether or not you can manipulate animal diets to enhance the, uh, the meat content mm -hmm. of certain nutrients, I, I believe that's possible mm -hmm. for selenium. Um, through enhancing the intake of animals. Um, so yes, it is possible to do that. I'll just jump on here yeah, because thank you. what's been happening at Rothamsted. <laughs> For a, a challenge, challengeable selenium. answers, your site. <laughs> yeah, as selenium, you said, I mean, we've been trying to look at if we can feed your um, lamb on grass. So the grass-fed lamb has a better chance of um, sort of accessing our uh, selenium. Uh, and again, depending on the soil types as well. So the forages, the type of forages that we grow in Pakistan, that's something is again would be of interest to explore in a bit more details. And then uh, it's always a question, issue is about bioavailability. So um, adding a selenium in diet will not straight away be available. I have to be uh, available in the farm. It's available uh, uh, to the gut. So I think that's a quite interesting thing. And uh, I think we need to have a further discussion on that. I just want to ask one question here uh, with your permission, Shinawar. And, and I think I was just trying to, to uh, figure out we have a lot of discussion around um, sort of the nutrient side, but uh, we do not touch much on in terms of the other issues are the contaminations coming in the food chain. One big issue, which is uh, antibiotics. So how do we see the issue of antibiotics coming through our livestock um, into our food chain? I mean, there isn't any mechanism. Is there any mechanism in Pakistan where you events you have um, given antibiotics to your, uh, to your livestock, you are not putting the milk into the supply chain. So anybody, uh, Dr. Tahir, anyone want to jump? So um, I will offer first of all my colleagues, Dr. Riaz, would you like to say something? Yes, go ahead. Uh, many thanks, sir. Uh, uh, there is a imprudent application of uh, antibiotics uh, at the farm particularly in the uh, chicken, uh, uh, there uh, the application of uh, uh, the antibiotics uh, is very wide, wide, wide. So uh, the studies uh, have been uh, elaborated. The studies have uh, been published uh, in many of the journals that uh, there is an impact, impact of uh, such uh, antibiotics uh, on the development of the antibiotic resistance. It's a fact uh, right now. However, there is a need that uh, uh, the regulatory agencies uh, in Pakistan, uh, they should play their role. Uh, they should, uh, uh, they should uh, 
control over the application of uh, such antibiotics as well as the uh, institutes uh, like universities uh, they should got, should also uh, train the farmers uh, they should conduct trainings uh, as well as uh, they should uh, publish in the local uh, newspapers uh, in Urdu, etc. So that okay. the, yeah. the yes, consumers should be aware about uh, yeah, along such with that. a big issue. Along with that, along with that, like food authorities, they are doing a little yeah. bit about, you know, they have started their jobs. And furthermore, it is not possible to eradicate all such kind of adulterations from milk, for example, until unless we'll have a cold chain process which I have heard several times that it has been started by the government sector, but still there is no practical, you know, uh, uh, implications I can see there. So anyhow, uh, with, with contamination or antibiotic, uh, you know, test, we cannot stop with the existing system of milk, milk supply chain system. And Thank as for as you know, I'm going to ask another me. question. Can Sorry, I say something? Yes, can please, I... Dr. Bhanasar. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khalid. Uh, as you talk about the antibiotics in uh, large animals, uh, mostly this is not practiced in Pakistan. That is the hormonal therapy, BST, most of the time uh, they are offering oxytocin only to get the milk. So antibiotic is not an issue in large animals. Yes, it is issue in the poultry. Uh, but if you are flushing out in the last week, then uh, the all this residual effect can be eliminated. But uh, our farmers normally uh, do not do it. So uh, yes, uh, if we will, uh, yet one major, uh, I think so, injustice person, he are uh, uh, replacing this antibiotic from prebiotics and probiotics. I have listened from uh, one of my, yes, uh, I didn't uh, mention the name of that uh, bigger pers uh, industry person uh, who, are in uh, who are involved in production and processing of the meat of the chicken. Uh, they are doing practice and they uh, replace this antibiotic with the prebiotics and probiotics. So they are getting okay. very good results. Thank uh, but, you so much, Dr. Manasa. I'm just conscious of the fact we got only two minutes left. We need to finish this off. Uh, last question again. I think this, these things coming to my mind. The other question is the pesticides, the, the use of pesticides and their contamination coming in the food chain as the MRL. We have seen the issues uh, in some export crops because uh, West uh, Europe is stopping those crops not to enter in the country if they have those high MRL levels. I just saw something on the, the events happening on rice. So is there any sort of um, uh, studies in Pakistan where, which you could see or show the common uh, sort of uh, our kitchen items when I'm buying my vegetables, okra? So what sort of MR level is there? Anybody want to just uh, volunteer, please? Uh, yes, there, there are studies. There are several studies uh, in, in PhD, uh, you know, degree program. Over students, they have studied the pesticides and insecticides. And they, uh, they, they have published their papers also. But again, there is a need to transmit towards that uh, implementation. Whatever you were saying, that there is a gap between the publication and to the you know, users. Uh, we need to, th there are certain you know, uh, regulations. Uh, Punjab Food Authority, they have uh, uh, prepared their regulations and they have mentioned a lot of you know, such kind of MRLs over there. But there is, in, in, again, uh, consistent you know, uh, control on those items. But it will take a long time. You know, if there are, if you see around to control a totally 100% control on food safety or and nutrition, you need to have a lot of, you know, uh, intermingled questions that you, you need to unfold those. So I think until unless once we all get together and once we all professionals move forward for the controlling of distributed single aspects, we cannot control otherwise. There, there is working on, they're still working on that. Could I say something? Uh -huh. and more? Yeah, so uh, the thing about uh, these um, pesticides, insecticides, organophosphates, fertilizers, artificial chemicals that we're using is that they have a hefty association uh, with childhood neurological problems, in particular with autism. Um, so we have uh, clusters of big clusters of autism in big cities because of heavy metal poisoning, uh, but also in farm, farming areas where they're poisoned with organophosphates and with other chemicals that the farmers are using. So I think it's really an urgent problem that we need to address. 
uh, in terms of uh, con knock on effects into health of the population. Mm -hmm. Thank and, you. Uh, Thank so you. Just adding to your question, Dr. Khalid, uh, there are a lot of reports, a lot of research have been reported from Pakistan uh, regarding the presence of pesticide residues, fertilizer residues, even antibiotic residues and different kinds of produce. But what is the solution? How we can mitigate these uh, uh, residues? Very few research is reported till now. Uh, some of our colleagues uh, in Arab University, Dr. Anwar, Professor Dr. Anwar and Rai Muhammad Amir, they have reported two papers. Uh, how uh, Dr. Atif Randava from, Dr. Atif Randava from, from India, he has also reported some paper how the uh, very, very small little household kitchen practices can mitigate uh, the presence of residue, but there is need of work. Um, there is need for more work in uh, on this aspect. Some of my students are also working about this: how we can decontaminate these pesticide residue or mycotoxin residue present in uh, in the end produce, which is going to be consumed directly by the consumer. So uh, that there is need of research, and some of the researchers are working in Pakistan at the moment for this. Thank you so much, Dr. Shinawa. So as, as I have time quoted, to, to close this so, session because the time just is a, just a last single half minute, I think. Uh, just continuing the uh, purpose of Dr. Shinawa that uh, I would request Dr. Halas, you and all the organizers that definitely uh, we should communicate at this forum over uh, contact numbers because there is a lot of uh, you know number of questions over there. And we can answer those, and even though we can show them studies and whatever, but 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 is being happening in various you know subjects like fertilizers and pesticides residues, we have a, uh, we have developed this uh, you know uh, software for a specific utilization. Rather, a person when needs a antibiotic, we we, sh we cannot give them two thousand mg per day. But this is the specific use of antibiotics with the human being. Similarly, we need to have the specific use of, uh, uh, you know, all uh, fertilizers and pesticides with the soil. So when we start from this step, will be good for all of us. And we should communicate over contacts so that they can contact with. For with respect to nutrition, I have also with me Dr. Kamran here, who is working a lot in nutrition sector, human nutrition. We can work together. This is all of no, my Thank side. you so much for your offer. I just. Uh, I think this is a, again this is scientists coming together and working on the national challenges and yep. uh, bringing this knowledge over to the community this is where the whole uh, ambition we have we carry from rob sign but again working with the team in pakistan i'm just conscious going to the next uh, thank you again to the panelists big thank you to dr tahir mm -hmm. dr uh Dr. Mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. mm -hmm. for, lead, for facilitating the session and our respected uh, okay, over to our uh, next talk yeah. next talk is is for us is you can't start. Yeah. Is, he, is he around he's going to lead on now uh, he's the senior vice president for fpcci is he is he around here uh, uh, back to you uh, dr Dr. Vakil, please. Dr. Vakil, are you there? Hey, thank you very much. Uh, I think next is Senior Vice President uh, from FPCCI, and uh, I would like to invite him. I, I think perhaps uh, he sent his message through his representative. So, Dr. Um, uh, Mia. Mayor Rashid, are you here? Yes, yes, please. Okay, carry on. Hello. Um, I'm really uh, sorry for uh, um, the SVP, FPCCI, because he was awfully, he is and was and has been awfully busy uh, for a week in international conferences, you know. On behalf of him, I have to uh, speak, and uh, the person who is sitting in front of, uh, besides me, Mr. Habib Ajmal, who is convener of FPCCI Standing Committee Punjab on Small Traders. He is desirous to announce uh, in uh, 10 seconds only, please, then I would say. Thank you. Thank you. I strongly support you all, a convener of FPCCI Punjab on Small Trade. Thank you.
ऋषि साहब आपकी वॉइस क्लियर नहीं आ रही आप जरा वॉइस प्लीज I on behalf of SVP would like to say, uh, missed all the uh, SVP FPCCI has generously announced that all the stakeholders, professor, doctor, scientists, and research scholars in particular, they all are invited to visit our office, and they all would be empowered. Uh, by their ideas by their innovation idea innovative ideas as you know uh, comstack advisor was here he was talking about science technology and innovation if any scientist any research scholar who thinks that he must be empowered he must be empowered as a nutritional entrepreneur he would be or she would be empowered to that level he would be empowered enough to incubate his or her innovate innovations to the decisive extent we strongly applaud we strongly applaud what you have presented here everyone has contributed to the decisive extent it is the dire need of the day to execute all the ideas in an impressive way in an impact oriented way in a demand driven way in a need oriented way so thank you so much thanks a lot it is a marvelous opportunity for us all and for you as well thank you so much uh, thank you very much uh, mr abdur rashid and uh, for your generous offer from fpcci so no no we have a chief guest with us uh, he is uh, professor dr anas sarwar qureshi he is vice chancellor at university of agriculture faisalabad and uh, his department is veterinary sciences and uh, uh, i would like to invite him for his comments and word of wisdom so sir please professor dr anas qureshi so bismillah rahman rahim thank you dr wakil it's a great privilege for me to be the part of international webinar a way forward to food quality and safety by being organized by mas university of agriculture faisalabad pakistan agricultural scientists forum federation of pakistan chambers of commerce and industries national alliance for safe food uk pakistan science and innovation global network comstech young professionals for agricultural development the quality life sustainable economy are dependent on public health the role of nutritious food cannot be neglected at individual or societal level we should critically decide on what we eat not only based on the benefits of specific diet but also its uh, drawbacks for selection of food it is important to note where food comes from what is its composition how the animals were raised or the vegetables grown while considering ethnic and religious obligations Uh, despite our uh, increased knowledge food borne disease is perhaps the most widespread health problem in the contemporary world deciding whether a food is safe or not is a difficult task food can never be proven to be entirely safe nor entirely hazardous it can only be proven to be hazardous to some degree under certain conditions while demanding completely safe food may not be very realistic it is possible to have food in which potential hazards have been reduced food quality and safety should be the main targets of future research in food production reliable paths to detect identify quantify characterize and uh, 
monitor quality and safety issues occurring in food are of great interest. Historically, addressing the issues of uh, mass hunger has been the focus. Fortunately, micronutrient malnutrition has gained considerable attention due to a surge in malnutrition related diseases. The scientific community is uh, striving to rule out food contamination due to substandard agricultural practices. In this regard, biofortification seems to be a very sustainable strategy to address the micronutrient malnutrition in developing countries. With predominant cereal-based diet, it can tackle the nutrient nutritional issues with the low cost and less hazards. Ladies and gentlemen, I congratulate the working team who did efforts for this very successful and valuable comprehensive event on burning issue of recent times. I thank you all of the speakers, organizers, and attendees. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your nice compliment and very comprehensive note on uh, today's webinar. Uh, so, no, is we are very near to end this very beautiful, very informative session. Uh, on, beha on behalf of Dean Faculty of Agriculture and Director Institute of Soil and Environmental Sciences, uh, I would like to thank all the collaborators uh, including the Pakistan Agriculture Scientist Forum, uh, Federation of Pakistan, National Alliance for Seafood, uh, UK Upsign, which is a very useful network. And uh, we were able to uh, invite two very talented speakers from UK. And uh, I am very much thankful for both Dr. Jalil and uh, Professor Nicola and I am also thankful to Professor Nokola that she is working very consistently in Pakistan to combat the uh, micronutrient. Uh, in this campaign can open new doors for further impact, impact oriented collaborations as they have already offered that they will uh, be able to, to fund the new innovative ideas uh, for incubation studies. So with, the, with this, I would like to thank all the speakers again and uh, all the participants and audience. And uh, I hope that we will meet at, an, at any other occasion to discuss about the malnutrition issues. So thank you very much. Much, much okay. well, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saab, for hosting this event. Thank you, Allah. Okay, Allah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aldi. Thank you, Allah. Thank you so much. Sir.